Thanks. Hello. Um, thanks a lot for uh, attending my talk. That's really appreciated. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it was a really nice economy class flight uh, over here. Can tell you all about that. <laughs> so. Um, my name is Georg, as it was already mentioned. Um, I'm with Ericsson, the program, open source program manager, and a contributor to the OpenSSF. And I'm really, uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the work that we've been doing in the OpenSSF on kind of putting together this compiler options hardening guide. Of course, I'd really like to stress that this has been a tremendous team effort, and I'm giving this presentation on behalf of the entire team, and I probably contributed the least to this. So all the the, the credit goes out to the entire team, in particular to my colleague Thomas Newman, who's running that activity and trying to keep everything together. So, yeah. Let's start and dig in with, well, and start with two facts that you are, of course, aware of. So, I keep it short. First of all, there is tons of C and C++ code out there, and that basically runs the world. And basically because C and C++ has been the preferred language for everything performance related, kind of embedded and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of this out there. The second issue is uh, uh, C++ or C is memory unsafe, causing time and again uh, severe security issues. So, okay, based on those by now well-known facts, there's a strong push towards moving away from C and C++ towards memory safe languages, and that I think is the absolutely right thing to do. Uh, however, there are two things that I'd like to point out in this presentation. First of all, as I said, there's tons of code out there, and that just makes it most likely prohibitively expensive to really rewrite everything in a memory safe language like Rust, um, or it will take a long time. And the second and probably even more interesting aspect is that even if you kind of transition some of your, uh, some components over to a memory safe language like Rust, research shows that um, a kind of still a large number of Rust crates have dependencies on memory unsafe code or kind of call into unsafe code. So that of course doesn't mean at all that we shouldn't go down that path, on the contrary. It just means that it will be a long, complex, and painful transition. And we need to make sure that as long as this transition is ongoing, we need to also focus on making the code that is still in C, written in C and C++ as safe as possible, or at least reduce the attack surface as much as possible. And that's the goal of this initiative. Then, of course, we are not the only ones who are aware of this, obviously. Um, on the contrary, over the last couple of years, um, there's been an increased attention from regulators on this topic. Uh, and as a result, we've seen a wide range of documents coming out, uh, reports, white papers, guidelines, and full-blown regulation to kind of create this uh, to highlight this demand to move away from memory unsafe languages. And this is, again, this challenge is what this group tries to contribute to. And our contribution is very specific, um, but it is, again, about creating documentation and, and, and educational material and a guide to help application developers make sure that they configure the programming tools that they're using such that the resulting software that comes out of those programming tools has a reduced uh, attack surface, so to say. And this high-level approach of kind of creating this guide and providing guidance to developers is, of course, deeply rooted in cl very classic product hardening, right? And, and in fact, also the foundation for the guide that we currently have was kind of, it, it started as a product hardening guide uh, that a team of security, product security guys at Ericsson wrote um, as guidance for our internal developers. But we noticed that the best practices working group had uh, a very early draft document up that tried to do really kind of the same thing. And we thought, okay, maybe we should contribute our internal guide and use that as a baseline to then continue to jointly develop that in a broader context in the OpenSSF. And I think, honestly, that turned out pre pretty okay. Um, yeah. So 
when, like in the mission statement, it says programming tools. Um, we focus primarily on C and C++ compilers, linkers, and those sorts of tools because the, the th thing here is really that those compilers implement, honestly, a fair amount of optional yeah, features that are just that optional. They're not enabled by default at all. So you need to ideally enable um, uh, yeah, features of the compilers to, for instance, warn you about certain things to harden the code explicitly. And um, uh, yeah, so knowing about these options, knowing about the trade-offs that you kind of have to consider is the key um, value that the guy tries to provide. I also like to point out that all of the major Linux distributions out there, they already use most of these options, if not all of them. So this is great, actually. That, that basically means if you're building on top of a major Linux distribution, um, you are already in a very good spot. And it's not that we basically should tell, let's say, a, a Linux distribution maintainer to use those options. This is, they are all aware of this. Actually, they have been great contributors to our effort. But the key value is really in the case when you, well, you compile your own, for instance, proprietary code, code or um, when utilizing open source code from source and build it yourself. Because then again, it's your responsibility to pick the right options uh, for your compiled tool chain. Good, so, well, why do we actually need an effort where kind of a small group of experts comes together in the OpenSSF and, and create a document, right? Shouldn't it, it's just about compiler options. There, isn't there documentation on this out there? <laughs> what, what are the challenges really? Well, it turns out that um, it's, it's actually not that easy uh, for a couple of reasons. So assuming you really want to do a good job and enable the right options for the, the application that you're developing, then well, start with understanding what the default options of the compiler is that you're using. Um, it's because it's not defined really at all, or let's say it's it's all over the place. The the def and the features that are enabled by default by a compiler very much depends, obviously, on the compiler itself, the version, and the configuration of the compiler, like where you sourced it from. De may even depend on the Linux distribution. So. In a nutshell, it is way better to explicitly set all the options because you can't really rely on saying, okay, I'm just going to use a modern compiler. It'll do the right thing for me. It's unfortunately not that easy. Then, as I said, many open source projects do not necessarily use all those options because maintainers are not aware of this. And again, it's a complex topic. Nobody blames them. Um, but if you kind of consume a binary that was probably built in the GitHub pipeline, right? not through a Linux distribution, then you don't really know which options were enabled, and then you'd probably rather build it from scratch using the options that you, that you should. Um, of course, in order to really have uh, or take an educated decision on which option to enable or to not to enable, you need to have all the data available. And um, options, of course, come with pros, like what is actually the, the gain in security versus what's potentially a performance overhead that you would run into. So that needs to be laid out clearly and in a consumable way in that uh, in the guide. And finally, some of the compiler options, they, they do bring you security gain, but they may not be compatible with all language concepts, for instance. So again, this is part of the documentation that we want to provide, like when to use, when not to use um, an option, and what are the, the use cases that are supported. Um, looking a little bit at, at kind of some research results, and this paper kind of underlines that it is really challenging to find the right options. Um, here we can basically see that in the in the desktop world, a large number of binaries already well have been produced with a reasonable set of yeah, compiler hardening options, uh, and that is mainly due to the Linux distributions already enabling all of this. But in the embedded world, where you typically have to kind of configure the entire thing yourself, it's only a fraction of the software that really uses uh, compiler hardening options. So there is a need for, for this sort of material. And of course, 
uh, we are also aware that this is not a silver bullet at all. It's just one tiny but hopefully valuable building block in the overall tool set of securing software that in combination with all of the other things that you should uh, apply, apply during your secure software development process that will help to produce software that has a reduced uh, attack surface. Okay, good. So what is actually the, uh, the content of the guide? So the, the guide is currently structured into four different pieces, or it covers four topical areas. The first one, of course, being the recommended compiler options themselves, um, like a short summary of the options you should be using, but then per option, more detailed information on the rationale, the use cases, performance impacts, and even some information on when you may not want to make use of an option. Uh, we have a section on discouraged compiler options that you should not necessarily use at all because in most cases they uh, create actually a security issue. Uh, there's a section on sanitizers. Those are compiler features that uh, instrument the generated code so that at runtime you can detect things like memory leakage, uh, race conditions, these sort of things. Um, as most of this is done, or most of those checks are done at runtime, they are probably too expensive from a performance impact perspective to use in production. But in uh, testing and development, they're certainly super valuable tools. And then there's an option on how to deal with debug information, um, how to kind of strip it out of uh, a binary and keep it separate. This, of course, is primarily more geared towards proprietary software because this is meant to make reverse engineering of a binary significantly harder. Um, that doesn't really necessarily apply too much to open source software because, well, you have the code available, obviously. So this has been, this is the core content of the guide. Um, we released the first version of it end of last year, and uh, this is what we have in there. Uh, in the meantime, we also um, started to create a separate document that uh, provides some information on compiler attribute uh, annotations. So those annotations are a means of telling the compiler a little bit more about the, the program as such. Um, it helps the compiler to understand uh, kind of data flows and data types a bit better so that more efficient optimizations can be performed by the compiler that eventually uh, benefit security and performance, obviously. And yeah, this is currently ongoing work, even though we're polishing the, or kind of not more than polishing, hopefully, um, adding more content to the entire guide throughout. So what are some of the lessons that we have learned during that journey? Um, in particular, when we look at it, the main challenge and the value that I kind of sketched initially, um, because eventually it's just about finding the right options. Yeah? But it really turns out that, first of all, identifying the right options is a tedious task. And then it's even more complex to dig through, let's say, the available <laughs> documentation, mailing lists, blog posts, and maybe even talking to the developers to really understand the rationale of an option. We typically have a little bit of a documentation issue here, as so often in the open source world, but that really makes this collaborative effort in the open SSF even more valuable because we, with the help of very knowledgeable people, hopefully do this only once and then help provide that to the larger development community uh, rather than having to, that everybody has to do it um, on their own. Ease of adoption is important. We originally set out to provide ideally just a single set of options, uh, recommended options that you would copy and paste in your make files and then that's that then you're in a good spot and we still have that but over time it became clear that of course there are some details that need to be considered. So there are now conditional options that are specific to architectures or the, the target that you're building and so on and so forth. Um, Tooling was mentioned before, that's also very important, right? We, we had this initial discussions about um, what kind of tooling can help us to identify if a makefile uses the right options or the recommended options or not. So 
we're really eager to also pursue those discussions going forward. And then finally, um, when we look at the, the, the kind of the group of contributors, they have had, or the contributors have very diverse background, re ranging from compiler developers, real experts, researchers, distribution maintainers to application developers and like doing that jointly in the OpenSSF really benefited the quality of the guide a lot because it added a lot of good content and at the same time made sure that it's also consumable. So roadmap, what are we planning to do going forward? Uh, as I said, the first release uh, got out la end of last year, but we are continuing to work on this. There will we'll add con con ah, we are continuously adding new documentation, new features. Ideally, we'd also like to cover additional compilers. Right now, it's primarily uh, GCC and um, Clang. Um, contributions are always welcome, uh, covering both, of course hardcore content about a compiler option, but also just improving readability, presentation, or the tooling that was just mentioned before. Um, this entire effort is running or is happening as a sub-initiative in the best practices working group, so you'll find all the information on GitHub, on Slack. Uh, we have regular calls, bi-weekly calls, and I think there's still a doodle out right now, so um, even though I really like the current time slot because it's a little bit European friendly, um, if you're interested in uh, kind of participating and want to have a say on the, the the time slot, well, you may want to find the doodle and leave a vote. Please don't make it too late. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and another QR code. I think that's the uh, that's the theme of the event. Uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Thanks a lot.